Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Real History. I am your host, Jared Frederick, and I'm pleased to be doing a breakdown in this episode of the latest trailer for Apple TV's Masters of the Air, set for a release on January 26th. As we mentioned in our previous breakdown of the earlier trailer, this is a much-anticipated nine-part series produced by Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, and Gary Getzman, the same creators who brought us A Band of Brothers and The Pacific. In that previous preview, we had a, I think, very good glimpse of what the series has the potential to offer. I'm really excited to be taking a look at what this newest trailer might indicate to us about the plot, the missions, and the men who were involved in them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at the newest trailer for Masters of the Air. What's the move? We lead our boys through. Mm. So you're rapping? Good nostalgic opening here, the big band. A girl with riding too is hard to find. Not if you know where to look. I'll miss you every second. Major Egan. You were the first pilot assigned to the 100th. Me and Buck Levin. You are in charge Egan? of 35 planes and 350 air crewmen. Don't you die on me before I get over there. Something big is brewing. The 8th will be sent in up the largest air armada ever assembled in the history of mankind. Straight into Hitler's territory. Been in complete and total air superiority. That's the mission. What? You might be the last pretty face I ever see. Oh, that rings so true to what so many were feeling. Yikes. Wow. What's the move? We lead our boys through. North All Africa, no doubt. Some of your friends ended up stranded for day a little bit. In, day out. That's something to a guy, doesn't it? We're here to fight Very the monsters. Crazy. The things these people are capable of. Oh. Well, they got it coming. A nod to the Holocaust, no doubt. Lord, guard and guide the men who fly through the great spaces of the sky. Are we Tuskegee men or what? Sir, yes, sir! Be with them traversing the air in darkening storms or sunshine fair. I think we may be done. We are going to sit here and take it. We're going to stick with our mission as long as we can fly. We won't go without a fight. Good, bold Art Deco <laughs> title font that they use for the imagery. Good stuff. So this trailer reveals a few additional things that perhaps weren't included in the teaser that came out a few weeks ago. And I'll just point out that the person who is releasing these trailers is doing a very good job timing-wise because the teaser came out, I believe, the day before Veterans Day and the major trailer came out the day before the Pearl Harbor anniversary. So they're releasing... Uh, these little bits of preview with the, the concept of historical anniversaries or commemorations in mind. So perhaps that's some good shrewd and wise marketing on their part. One of the earliest things that stands out to me uh, after we see the big band dance here uh, is the fact that uh, Gail Clevin, who is played by Austin Butler, uh, is dancing with a young woman. And uh, that actress is... Isabel May, who gained a lot of fame by playing one of the protagonists in 1883 on Paramount. And I, I certainly hope and pray that this series is more accurate than that one. We could do a whole other <laughs> breakdown on that series, but that's for another time and place. And I looked her up in the credits, and she is listed as Marge. And I immediately recognized the fact that she is playing Marjorie, who later becomes Gail Clevin's wife. And in one of the subsequent scenes where he's holding up a photograph of her in the cockpit, uh, that very much mirrors a real-life photograph of Clevin, who is sort of rising up out of his bunk, perhaps right before a pre-dawn briefing. And uh, you see two photographs of Marge looking down on him. And so 
Uh, the fact that even the girlfriend characters are real in this series, I think, really speaks to the level of homework that uh, teller writer John Orloff committed to this. And here we are introduced to John Egan, who was the first air exec, I believe, for the 100th Bomb Group. And one of the prevailing themes that I think we're going to be seeing throughout this series is the prisoner of war experience because, a little bit of a spoiler alert, so many of the main characters depicted in Masters of the Air were shot down and they were captured. And what's really incredible about a lot of them is that several of them escaped, they were rescued, they worked their way back, and they continued to fight the war. Uh, so there are some really astounding stories to be discovered uh, with in this series. And it's certainly my hope that the film uh, gives these men the, the credit and the dignity that they deserve because whew, they really went through the meat grinder in so many cases. The colonel here up on stage, I am guessing, is the commander who's Neil Harding, who went by the nickname Chick. And so, uh, as is the case with majors and colonels, in some cases, uh, they're a little bit older than the lieutenants and captains who are under them. But uh, if you look at somebody like Egan, you know, he looks like somebody who might be in his mid or late 30s, but he was only in his late 20s. So war really aged these guys at a, an accelerated rate. And I really get the sense that we're going to see that sort of character evolution as the series progresses. Uh, this part where one of the airmen is interacting with what I presume is a Red Cross worker who is giving out perhaps coffee or donuts before a flight, which they did uh, very frequently. Many of these bases uh, had Red Cross attendees who provided uh, various services to the airmen, uh, uh, food, they ran a club, they ran a canteen, they oversaw social activities during downtime. Uh, that's a, a really good thing to include here, something that's pretty much omitted out of previous cinematic depictions like 12 o'clock high, that there's no women on base or anything like that in many instances. But this part where he says that, you know, you might be the last pretty face I see or last pretty thing I look at, uh, that rings very true in my mind to the sentiments that a lot of these airmen were feeling. Because, and I've read this in so, so many accounts, where you were appreciative of being alive, but you had to live life to the fullest because you didn't know when your number was going to be up. And so people lived harder, they lived quicker, uh, they lived out life at likewise an accelerated pace simply because you didn't know when you might buy the farm, to use some of the lingo from the time period. Uh, so that is something that I think, for as subtle as it is, is quite accurate to the emotions of the time. And at this point, at what is undoubtedly a depiction of prisoner of war life, it seems that Egan, one of the, the characters who does in fact become a prisoner of war, it looks like his camp is under friendly fire, it might be strafed by allied aircraft, and he's taking an American flag to hoist it up above to avoid any sort of needless death or anything like that. I'm not 100% sure if he actually did that. That's something I need to do a little bit more research on. Uh, but this too is something that seems authentic to the circumstances that a lot of prisoners of war found themselves in. When we think of one of the other officers who was in the 100th Bomb Group, Rosie Rosenthal, which I think is a, a great nickname for uh, an officer, uh, when he crashed, uh, he actually came upon Soviet soldiers. This is in the, the closing weeks of the war in Europe. And he hoisted out an American flag and he started yelling out, uh, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, Lucky Strike, Coca-Cola, bombing Berlin, etc., etc. Uh, and so using tangible items or highly recognizable phrases or images to indicate or clarify one's identity in these very volatile situations, 
uh, it too is something that happened with great frequency. And so I'm interested in looking to see how that scene plays out. In our previous segment, Analyzing Masters of the Air, I made some reading recommendations. Uh, my own forthcoming book, Into the Cold Blue, co-authored by my good friend and World War II veteran pilot John Homan was among them. Uh, check out more information about that book in the link below. Uh, but I realize uh, perhaps not everybody learns by reading, you know, big memoirs or tomes about the 8th Air Force. So I'm going to make some additional recommendations for you. Uh, many of you are undoubtedly familiar with the History Channel series World War II in HD. Uh, and there is actually a sequel to that first installment of that series entitled World War II in HD, The Air War. Uh, this one is a little bit more compact. It's a little bit more concise, but it includes some really great visuals, firsthand accounts, really compelling commentary. And I heartily recommend this one if you find yourself being more of a visual learner. And it's one of the really good sporadically made legitimate history documentaries that the History <laughs> Channel has made in recent years. There are no aliens in this one. Another really good one to check out is more along the lines of a coffee table book. And this one is called The Mighty Eighth at War by Chris McNabb. And why this one is really good is that there are just a ton of great graphics, visuals, artifacts, eyewitness testimony, and this one is very digestible. You can read it in small uh, spurts and so on and so forth. Uh, so I would heartily recommend uh, this one as well if you would like a more leisurely read, perhaps, on the experiences of 8th Air Force Airmen during the Second World War. That wraps things up for this episode of Real History. We, while you're here, we also invite you to check out one of our latest features, and that is my recent trip to Iwo Jima, which I thoroughly recorded, and Andy, our trustworthy producer and editor, spent a lot of time piecing all of that together. Uh, this was a real passion project for us, and we highly encourage you to check out that as well. If you're here for Masters of the Air, you're likely interested in World War II, and I have no doubt that you'll really enjoy our first ever virtual battlefield tour of Iwo Jima. So please check it out. Until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious.